Welcome to New Australian Bulletin. Um, tonight, we don't have with us uh, Dr. Jim okay. Slowen. He's uh, otherwise disposed. But uh, we have our good guest, um, Nick Griffin. And um, tonight, Nick, we've got a few things to talk about. The first thing I want to uh, bring up is uh, Ukraine and uh, mm. the, uh, the the price cap uh, the the NATO partners, or I believe a number of countries, have imposed a sixty dollar a barrel cap on uh, Russian oil exports, which I understand isn't going to hurt them in any way at all. Um, well, uh, in, into into the Ukraine debacle, we've also got NATO's partners um, have. Uh, totally diminished capacity to be able to mm. uh, fight any war they start with Russia because they've got, got like four days' worth of ammo and supplies remaining. Um, furthermore, what's, what, what's become of the weapons that have been sent to uh, Ukraine, we mm. understand they're now uh, being funnelled into Chad. Um, and as Ukraine uh, <coughs> persists with drone strikes, a very tolerant Russia, a Russia which has been uh, offering peace talks all along has now, you know, embargoed it. They're not going to talk it. So what's your uh, view on the Ukraine situation, Nick? A fair few questions there, Nathan. So let's start with the, the first one, the, the oil cap. Uh, and I saw a, a, a comment being made in Russia just, just yesterday about this. Uh, saying that this is rather like a group of alcoholics sitting in a basement somewhere, getting together and deciding they're not going to pay more than 60 ru rubles for bottles of vodka. <laughs> and that pretty much sums it up, really. I don't know, somewhere in the background of this, I guess, because it's all high finance. So somewhere in the background of this, someone or a little group of people who are already stinkingly rich are going to get even richer. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But overall, I think this is a showboating desperate attempt by people who are no longer in charge of events to pretend that they somehow are in charge of events uh, the cap apparently has been set at 60 dollars a barrel which is uh, more than the russians are selling their discounted oil already to people like uh, the turks uh, and the indians so it's not going to make a blinder difference to them so what's the purpose of this we really don't know the only thing we, that we can be sure of as you know, non-financial, complete amateurs is that Russia has said that they are not going to sell oil to any country that goes along with this price cap thing. Mm. So they've been selling oil to all countries, including the United States of America. The amount of oil that the Russians are selling to the Yanks has gone up a very large amount during this conflict. Uh, and the Russians have said, well, if people are pretending that uh, they, they can interfere with the market, we'll deal with that simply by not letting them in the market at all. So this is another one of the Western sanctions, which is going to blow up in the faces of the West. The only question in this, really, is whether it's that we're simply run by totally incompetent buffoons who are just uh, virtue signaling and get everything wrong, or whether they're doing it deliberately uh, by way of... Uh, economic and energy suicide by Russia, so that they're doing what they want to do in terms of downgrading our society, but they can try and blame Putin instead of taking the blame for themselves and green energy policies. And I don't know, I suspect it's a mixture. Some of the people involved are just incompetent lunatics, and others are thoroughly sinister people using the Russians as an excuse for bad things that they want to do to us. It's a, a planned detonation. It must be because... Uh... The most uh, compelling effect I see of that is that the Europeans are going to suffer because energy prices, as energy crisis there <laughs> already, if they've committed to um, cutting off their nose to spite their face to pay more for energy, that makes it even harder for the uh, poor suffering uh, citizen of one of these European countries and of... Yeah, sure. Hey, so well, it, 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 even even Macron, president of France, is now saying really quite loudly that uh, you know this isn't on because the um, the people ruining America are asking us to fight this economic war, but we're paying a far higher price for it than America. So in, in effect, this is helping the Americans 
rebuild their industry at the expense of ours. So that's certainly going on. There's no doubt that anything which is coming from the USA is primarily targeted at Western and Central Europe. They know they're not hurting Russia, but they're deindustrializing Europe, particularly Germany, but you know the whole of Europe as a whole is being deindustrialized, and large numbers of these companies are already starting to go to the USA where energy is far cheaper. So it's a way of keeping the doomed dollar up for a bit longer. I think that's probably the in the end the real crux of it but why the european political elites are going along with this suicide you know that's another matter as i said to what extent is it folly to what extent is it treason we certainly don't know at present we may never know but you also raised the question so following on from that uh, about uh, weapons in this appalling appallingly destructive war you know and the the russians are pre- the russians at present are wiping out one battalion of Ukrainian and mercenaries every single day in Bakhmut alone, between 500 and 800 men being killed every single day. This is, you know, this is First World War levels of disaster and folly. And they've been killed for no strategic or tactical reason at all. It's just a matter of the way of showing the West that, oh, we can hold Russia and you've got to give us lots of money because we might be able to win this next spring, something like that. Truly wicked. But anyway, how is this now is no longer a war between Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, the war between Russia and Ukraine finished sometime in the spring. This is a war between Russia and NATO with Ukrainian conscripts and an increasingly large number of foreign mercenaries uh, on the other side. But it's this is a NATO war. How's NATO doing? As you said, there's now uh, many reports coming out, not of Russian propaganda, because all war, pro- war propaganda you have to question. But these are reports coming out of Western news agencies and Western intelligence and uh, military institutions saying that NATO is running out of weapons. The figure you quoted was I think, four days. I guess that's for NATO overall, because uh, a number of NATO countries, 20 of NATO countries have already said that they simply don't have any more munitions, particularly howitzer shells and missiles, anti-aircraft missiles and so on. They simply simply don't have any spare to give to Ukraine because their own armies have now run out. Their arsenals are empty. And the most striking figure I saw is that Germany, which after all is the economic, military and industrial powerhouse of Europe in production terms, and they've now got uh, enough serious uh, shells and missiles to fight a war for the, for the Wehrmacht, the German military, to fight a war for, sorry, Bundeswehr. Wehrmacht was a little while ago, wasn't it? The Bundeswehr has enough uh, shells and uh, missiles to fight a war to defend Germany for two days, or, according to some other German defence analysts, for a few hours. I mean, it's it's quite <laughs> stunning. Britain is still sending kit, but not very much. The, Fre- the, the French have said you can't have any more actual weapons, uh, but we'll send you humani- humanitarian aid because we're not giving up on you. Uh, and the uh, as for the Americans, and again, you'd think, you know, the Americans, it was the American mil- industrial machine which really fueled the Allies' victory in the Second World War, including to quite a significant extent in material terms, the Russians. So you'd think, well, the Americans can fight this war. I was watching a clip with the CEO of uh, Raytheon, which is one of the big military industrial complex companies in the USA. Uh, And he was saying, we simply can't supply these high tech missiles. We're out. We're running out of them. Uh, And you might think, well, they can build some more. Yeah, they can. But part of their problem, of course, is the supply chains are now so complex complex and uh the offshoring of serious industry from america and like the rest of the west has gone on for so long that a number of the parts and the kit and the equipment and the raw materials as well that they need to churn out more of these high-tech missiles come from china come from russia so this is a problem for nato it's very interesting because clearly a couple of years a years ago if you were asking could we have a third world war if you were sensibly you'd say well barring mistakes we won't have a nuclear war because nobody wants to commit suicide even if the elites want to get 
hundred and ninety eight percent of it. Yeah, they can go and hide in bunkers, but what do you come out to? You know, so a couple of years ago, you just said, well, you can't a nuclear war, so, but you could have a conventional war because bloody though it would be, NATO would win. That was the received wisdom a couple of years ago. I think even the Russians at least feared was also true. Now it's clearly not the case. Russia started the war in uh, Ukraine back at the start of this year with a view, with the, with the stated war aim of demilitarizing the Ukraine, and they're now well on the way to demilitarizing NATO as well. Uh, and uh, people have asked me recently, looking at the war, well, why is it that the Russians, with the strikes which they're taking out at Ukraine's entire energy network, which, of course, is what uh, NATO did in Serbia. You know, it's quite a legitimate form of war. It's certainly a far more legitimate and humane form of war to take out uh, a country's electricity system, uh, as was done in and as is now being done in Ukraine, than to do what the Brits and the Yanks did in the Second World War, which is to take out the enemy's population for the mass murder of innocent civilians. So it's a perfectly reasonable form of warfare. But why haven't the Russians finished it off you know they keep on they have a blitz they do d huge damage to the uh, ukrainian energy system then they back off a couple of weeks later they come back do it again and some analysts are saying well what they're doing they're giving them time to repair to use up uh, essential spares and all the rest of it then they hit it again but um i think there's more to it than that i think what they're doing and we'll see more of this is that rather than simply leaving ukraine without any electricity at all they're bringing it to the position where one more strike will finish it completely and plunge it back into the 18th century. And you cannot run a modern war in an 18th century country, especially a huge country like Ukraine. You know, it's the size of, it's not huge compared to, to Australia, maybe, but it's the size of uh, Spain and France combined. You know, this is a huge, huge country. Can't function without electricity. So by bringing it to the point where one more big wave of strikes will destroy its electricity system altogether, I think they're forcing NATO to, and NATO is desperately trying to avoid it, but they're trying to force NATO to pour its most sophisticated anti-missile systems, defence systems, into Ukraine to protect what is left of Ukraine's energy industry. And at that point, then, the Russians have a win-win, because the, especially if they then turn to using uh, drones primarily for these strikes, they're using a drone which costs... $25,000, and the missile which will take it down, if it can take it down, is costing half a million dollars. So if the drone gets intercepted, NATO loses a huge amount more from someone's military budget. And if the drone doesn't get accepted, uh, doesn't get intercepted, uh, then uh, Ukraine loses, loses some more of its uh, energy structure, and it becomes even more important for NATO to carry on throwing these fantastically expensive missiles at incoming, which really doesn't cost very much at all. So they're draining to drain the Ukrainian and mercenary manpower. So I think they're increasingly using the energy system as the bait in order to drain NATO of money and its most sophisticated weapons. So this is a story which is grinding on, but as I say, it's no longer a story about the military destruction of Ukraine. It's about the destruction of the military capacity of the whole of NATO. And just one more thing, and I finish to this, of greater relevance to Australians, because Ukraine and Western Europe, as you know, is an awful long way away from you. Uh, but it's already one of the key complaints coming out of the Republican uh, Party in the States and other, out of the military in the States, uh, is that this is so draining to their reserve. That they can, they no longer have the capacity to defend issue here, uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that at some point the Chinese will step in and take advantage of what is aggression. And you can look at all sorts of things. What are the Americans doing here? But uh, overall, they've made a fantastic cock up of this. They've bitten off more than they can chew. And you've got to wonder where the money's coming from, too. I mean, America. Over to you. Yeah, you got to wonder where the money's coming from too, because uh, 
you know, America's, you know, astronomically in debt to China. Um, they're obviously just printing it, sending billions over to uh, Ukraine, yep. which I believe is going to fund uh, Zelensky's lifestyle uh, when he decides to cut and run. Um, <laughs> among uh, things, yes. Um, yep. Among among things, yes. Yep. So uh, how they, uh, you know... The well, it, it is more than that because, of course, the... Um, uh, the, the scandal of the the crypto firm was it FTX yeah. uh, showed very clearly that large amounts of the uh, billions of the aid money which is being funneled into Ukraine is then being recycled back to the Democrat crime crime syndicate. So you know, who cares about America when you're a Democrat politician with your nose in the trough? It's not about America, is it? It's about them and about their cronies. So there's that. Uh, and the other thing, yeah. Uh, America can't afford this war, no doubt about it. It's all either coming out of taxpayers' pockets or increasingly, as you say, it's just being printed out of thin air. It's debts for future generations. They can't afford it. But they can't afford not to have it. I think that's the thing. Because absent some kind of victory in this, they're going to end up with Russia and China at the head, basically, of the world economy. And... The majority of the countries of the world, probably not the stupid uh, uh, Brits and West Europeans and the stupid Australians, will carry on you know, doing things with uh, with dollars. But everybody else in the world is going to be using some other it's a basket of currencies or some new international trade currency that the uh, Russians and the Chinese come up with, probably based on industrial assets, gold and crypto something along those lines, but it won't be the dollar as the reserve currency and the trading currency of the world. And it's that uh, system whereby the Americans have printed basically most of the world's international currency for free, and other countries have borrowed it off them or bought it off them. That's the mechanism which has allowed the Americans to survive in the very wealthy lifestyle to which they become accustomed, but to which they are no longer entitled because they've given away their industry. So if the Americans lose that struggle and the dollar is no longer the reserve currency, then the system is finished. Because the, the, at that point, they will simply go bust genuinely because they can't keep on printing money forever if the rest of the world aren't buying it. If it's just printed for internal use, it'll put America into hyperinflation. So the Americans are caught between a rock and a hard place really and truly. They have their war. They try to intimidate the rest of the world into carrying on with the dollar. Or they explode, either way, or implode. Either way, in the end, they're going to implode. The game here, as always with politicians, is to try to kick the can down the road far enough so it doesn't implode on their watch. Well, the Democrats have certainly uh, feathered their nests ahead of the... Mm. Uh, Collapse, haven't they? They've taken care of that. Now, um, let's get uh, some uh, background on what's happening in your uh, tiny <clears throat> island. I understand that you're uh, currently under occupation by uh, the uh, Albanian nationals. In fact, I hear Albania's uh, empty <clears throat> right now. They've yeah. all gone there, and they're demanding um, they're demanding rights. You know, they're calling uh, your, what, what is it, uh, not your foreign minister, your foreign um, head of state affairs, I can't recall her job title, um, an Indian woman. Uh, they're calling her a racist because uh, she made uh, yeah. some comments about the uh, influx of immigrants into uh, England as akin, akin to a, an invasion. Were they her words? Yes, yeah, she said that specifically. Yeah, it was specifically uh, about uh, the Albanians. Uh, and, of course, she's in favour of immigration. The Tory party is in favour of immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a net influx of over half a million last year. That's a net influence. So the headlines say, oh, we've got half a million more immigrants. That's not the case, because half a million people left Britain permanently. Now, some of them are immigrants going home, but an awful lot of them are Brits getting out, emigrating, retiring. Uh, and so the actual influx of newcomers was a million. 
million in, half a million out means a net influx to half a million. So a million third worlders, basically, because the people of West of Eastern Europe, apart from Ukraine, have stopped coming largely since Brexit. So a million third worlders came in, half a million people, a lot of our people left. So it is an invasion, but the Tories are in favour of that. Uh, Sunak in particular, obviously, has very close ties to India. And there's huge numbers of Indians pouring in, enormous. But uh, Suella Braverman made this uh, uh, comment off the cuff. No, I think it's carefully planned because they want the British public to still think that the Tories share their concerns about immigration. It's the old trick. So mm. the Albanians would do because the Albanians are, at least if you have in an Indian, there's a reasonable chance that you're getting someone, for instance, who's tech savvy, who will simply sit down and work and will also pay their taxes. But if you have uh, an Albanian in, especially if, if you have 10 Albanians in, you've just imported another drugs gang. That's the reality of it. So these are probably among the, well, they're among the least desirable, uh, even from a capitalist point of view, uh, immigrants that we can have in. From a destroy the white race point of view, well, they're white enough that mixed in, they wouldn't make that much difference, actually. Uh, so uh, Africans or uh, sub subcontinental Indians do a far better job. So really neither ca neither the capitalists nor the anti-white race haters see a particularly va particular value in Albanians. So they're the ones now being set up as these are the bad ones. We must keep them out, but we can let all the others in. So I think that's what's going on there. But certainly there's a load of them pouring in. Uh, and of course, there's also concern uh, in Britain uh, about the number of Ukrainians coming in because although they're white, although they're Christian, or at least some of them are, and by they are by cultural heritage, uh, they're getting a reputation as being extremely ungrateful, uh, extremely aggressive, extremely unpleasant, and nobody wants them at all. I, I've, I've read some uh, stories about that. Uh, especially as they're featherbedded beyond you know, all the others. So, oh, immigration, now there's this chap here in Ophel. You know, it's been the underlying and core issue of British politics since 1968 uh, at the latest. And it goes on, it just, you know, for a year or so it dies down a bit, but then it comes back. So we're in the middle of another big immigration issue. And there's the Tories trying to pretend that they still understand by dropping these things about invasion because it won't make any difference at all. We'll get more and more and more of them because that's what everybody in the system for different reasons wants. Well, they're getting their way. Uh, they just released the census um, in England for uh, yeah. 2021 census. And according to that, five major cities, uh, whites are uh, now a uh, m minority. Minority, yes. Yeah, yeah sure, abs absolutely so. And this is, can you believe the census figures? Uh, I do quite a lot of genealogy in this. You can believe, I think, the census returns from uh, 1881. You know, absolutely, you can believe them from the 1930s uh, because I had family told me who live where and all the rest of it. But can mm. you believe the census now? You look at the census, at the questions, at what they're measuring and so on, at the way uh, in, in which uh, it set out near the white population. It didn't even allow the English to exist as a category for years. The census is highly politicised, highly politicised. Uh, and it only shows what people are prepared to tell them. So I have no doubt that there's very large numbers of illegal immigrants uh, who simply avoided the census because they feared that if they put down where they live and how many are in the house, that someone from immigration will come knocking. So it's inherently unreliable. It's reliable in a country which is homogeneous, where everyone knows they belong and have a right to be there. A census in a country with mass illegal immigration is inherently unreliable. But on top of that, you've got the fact the thing is highly politicised. The, the gender questions are there this time. Yeah, how do you identify? Mm. You know, this po poisonous, pernicious, cultural Marxist, global homo horror, it's all there within the census. So the people who do that are quite capable of, well, they delayed the release of the census for basically a year. For why? With no explanations. So they're quite capable of simply rigging the census. And when you consider that on July the 10th, 2005, Britain, everybody told us, had three million Muslims. And on July the 12th, the day after the 
uh, the bombings on the London tube uh, and bus system, everyone was telling us that we have one and a half million Muslims in Britain. So the number halved in two days. Miraculous. And we're now told, so that was in 2005. And we're now told we've got, according to the census, how many? Three million. Oh, come on. If you drive from through London, Birmingham, up to Bradford, through Leeds, round to Manchester, you'll see as many as that. I exaggerate slightly. But anyone who believes that there's just three million, it's nonsensical. Because if there was three million in 2005, there can't be three million now, even if there was one and a half million, the number who come in in recent countries, including in recent years, all the Albanians, all the Afghans, the huge numbers are coming from the Middle East and so on. There was another splendid riot in London last night when Morocco won their round of the World Cup, just mm. as in Holland the other uh, last week and so on. There are vast numbers of these people, and there's simply no possibility there's only three million. So the census shows the way that the demographics of, Brit of Britain are going, but I'm sure it underestimates just how bad they are. In any case, we've still got the issue that virtually nobody out there understands that however many Brits we've got now, in 20 years' time, when the boomer generation is gone, the number will have dropped off a cliff. And that, unfortunately, is where we are. This country cannot be turned around by any means. The only salvation, it will come, I've no doubt, the only salvation for the indigenous people of this country will be when we've seen the complete collapse of this consumerist, capitalist, industrial society, which we are going to, not least because of the demographic problem in any case, when we've seen the complete collapse and we've had 100 years of chaos and nastiness and no health service uh, and no vitamin uh, D tablets and all the rest of it, at the end of that, the indigenous people of this country will be back as the only people here because that's the way it is. Unless the only possible alternative to that is that by some anti-historical miracle, we managed to put together a, a stable multicultural, multi-ethnic society, uh, in which case it will look very much like Syria or, Le or Lebanon before the Mossad and the CIA just basically destroyed those countries with civil wars. Uh, and you have different populations, different communities, and they work together, they trade together, they go down the street together, but culturally and in genetic and marriage terms, etc., they generally stick to themselves. And it might be possible that we end up with a society in which we all manage to rub along, but those who want to mix will just mix and sort of vanish into, the, into some kind of uh, mixed melting pot part of the community. But those who want to stay the same, which is the healthy instinct of most human beings, will still the say, say the say, stay, stay the same. And yes, we Brits will be a minority, not just in some cities, but right across the whole board. But we will still be the biggest minority. And if we learn to organise and think as a block, that we think about us before we think about them. We look about us before we, we look after us before we worry about, any, about them. And we don't go and fight them, but neither do we mix with them and have kids with them. The Brits, if they do that, will exist in a reasonable life in a society which can work, but is not the same as the one which I grew up with. You know, that society cannot be bought back. There's no doubt about it. As I say, what, our people will survive as a significant and potentially happy ethnic block. I've no doubt about that, but it'll either be through something like Syria or Lebanon or even Switzerland. You know, they came out of multiple civil wars and established the Canzon system and everyone sort of got along thereafter. We might get that, or there'll be hell to pay out there. And at the end of that, because we're the ones who basically built, not only built this country, we're shaped and formed by this country, by this climate, by where we are. Uh, and we're here because we're the ones best adapted to it. And at the end of what's coming, we still will be. But uh, that's a long way down the road. Canada is promoting uh, euthanasia. Apparently, it's killing uh, about 10,000 of yeah. its citizens a year. And we've heard a couple of horrible uh, stories coming out of there. For instance, a Paralympian, a Canadian girl. Yeah, I, show, I showed this on the uh, Templar report I did last night, as a matter of fact. Uh, oh, a la la lady, appalling case with 
Uh, she's there, unable to get up and down stairs. She's been asking for a stair lift for five years. And uh, when she started pressing the authorities for a stair lift, uh, she was instead offered euthanasia. I mean, a truly appalling case. But as I said on the show last night, this is the problem. If you've got someone in your family or had someone in your family who's you know, been dying in agony, perhaps of bone cancer or something like that, then the phrase that people often use is, well, you wouldn't, if it did that to a dog, you know, you'd be arrested. You know, it's only kind at certain points, you know, to, to put someone to sleep. Uh, and this that case shows the problem there, that if you open the, the door just ajar a little bit for the cases where all sort of sense and humanity basically says, yeah, that person should be allowed to die with some dignity. You open the door, but then once you've opened the door, all sorts of horrors pour through it because you've crossed the Rubicon, you've established the precedent that it's OK to kill people under certain circumstances. And it's very much like the LGBT thing. And we now see the horror of the transgender indoctrination of children, little kids being told that they can uh, get themselves mutilated without their parents even knowing. And truly ghastly. That's only possible because in Britain uh, in the 1960s, they legalised homosexuality between two adult men in their own bedroom, which was an obvious. Why on earth should the state bother about that? You know, a state that's got the right to peer into people's bedrooms is actually a state that's too powerful. And you know, it's obvious that a couple of blokes or women have lived together for 30 years. Why on earth should be persecuted for having sex? But you open the door for that essentially reasonable thing and horrors pour through. And it's the same with euthanasia. So they open the door in Canada, in Holland, for the handful of people who are in such agony that the doctors can't control it. And everybody thinks they should die. And they said before they got to that state they wanted to. You open the door for that reasonable case and you end up pushing disabled veterans to be killed rather than invest in a stair lift for them. Truly horrible case. But that's you know that's what happens. And it's uh, suffusing Canadian popular culture because uh, an uh, adjacent story to that is that of a Canadian uh, fashion company that's produced an ad, or I have seen the ad, um, which is glorifying assisted death. Wow. It's a very, wow. very subtle message. And I, wow. have to, I, I have to posit that this cannot but be um, a, a part of the Great Reset obsession with uh, resetting the population numbers of this planet. And it's interesting when you get men like uh, Bill Gates, who for all intents and purposes was a grifter, who yeah. uh, became phenomenally wealthy with other people's uh, brain work, um, whose money imbues them with uh, this godlike uh, right to uh, make decisions about uh, abstract yeah. numbers of uh, people. Uh, so I, I believe that this death cult um, attached to, to this sort of uh, globalist um, uh, ersatz socialism, whatever you want to call it, uh, has at its preoccupation cutting birth rates, i.e., um, the transgender and the mm -hmm. uh, mutilation of children because that erases their productivity. The COVID-19 vaccine, um, which uh, has resulted in uh, morticians pulling uh, bands of spaghetti out of uh, uh, the arteries of corpses. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that mm -hmm. documentary. Um and uh, now, of course, are you poor? Because that's another one. There's just a, there was a fellow in Canada that applied for euthanasia because, well, he was uh, sick and he was on medication, but his rooming house got sold and he couldn't yes. afford. Yep. And so they said, well, no worries, soil and green. We'll play you some uh, classical music while you lay down in a pod, watch a nice clip of what the world used to be like, and then we'll you know, chuck into the biscuit uh, maker and feed the uh, hungry, you know. <laughs> you can see the ad with the uh, Yeah, sure, sure. I, I, think, uh, I think that, yeah, obviously, if you set out, as the global elite clearly have set out, it's in their own words, if you're aiming to 
slash the world's population. You can't do it. There's not one magic silver bullet which does the job. Actually, contraception is pretty damn good. That's done most of the work already. And there's the question, really, why they why do they need to get rid of us? Well, in the next 20 years, we're gone anyway. Our population is going to go through the floor and the population uh, even of Africa, even in Africa, male sperm rates are dropping through the floor. We didn't know this until recently because the research on sperm quality was only being done in civilized industrial societies. But now it's being done in the third world as well and everywhere right across the world. Probably due to microplastics. That's the most likely bet. But various chemicals of the modern world are simply destroying the fertility of everybody on the planet. For the matter, apparently, it's also now being observed in dogs. So which aren't particularly closely related to us, even according to the uh, evolutionists. So everything across the planet is being hit in fertility terms for one reason or another. But even without that, as I say, just with the demographic winter that's coming, our population is going to crash in any case. And that includes even you know the Middle East, uh, Asia and so on. Their population is going to crash as well. The only place in the world still at present producing enough kids over deaths to create a potential problem, if you believe that human populations are a problem, is Africa. So it's gone. So the elite don't actually need to do this really and truly unless they're, I suppose, particularly greedy to get rid of us really quickly. And then, yeah, every little counts. You don't. This is a Leninist tactic. How do you eat a large salami? Lenin asked his followers and as they sat there not knowing. He said, well, you slice it you know, into thin pieces and then you eat the pieces. So that's the way you deal with a population problem. It's the way that the uh, the European question is being dealt with by those who hate us. You know, whether it's encourage homosexuality, encourage contraception, encourage childlessness, uh, encourage euthanasia. It all has that effect. But realistically, not that many people are going to accept euthanasia. You know, some are. But um, those who are being pushed, like that, like, like the, the lady we were talking about in the wheelchair, once you push beyond, a, there'll be a certain number who are really seriously mentally ill or are in really serious pain or something who will accept it. The law of diminishing returns. The further you go out into society, the more pushback there'll be and people won't accept being killed. So there'll be a little bit. There'll be lots of stupid, hysterical Greta Thunberg type girls who, if it becomes a fashion to be euthanized, they'll want to be euthanized. But the people who want to be euthanized will soon go from the breeding population. It's not a long term strategy for getting rid of large numbers of people. It's either just one very small slice off the sausage or I think and it's obviously partly that I think it's also partly this is about the wickedness of the global elite. This is about the the, the pagan and the satanic undertones to all of this this is simply about killing human souls because you can and every single one it's about your power these are sociopaths psychopaths and satanists and it's about their power to do bad things because they get off on it and i think plus of course euthanasia clinics they make money there's not much money to be made in abortion clinics anymore because the young population is so small that demographically their market is fading the money's in death. The money's in death. So this is about money and power and badness as well as about cutting our numbers. Well, that uh, remark about Satanism is uh, fairly uh, topical because uh, of that. Um, I I'm going to mispronounce this, but uh, that fashion company, yes. Balin, Balance. I'm not even going to bother. You, whatever it is, yes. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. And uh, they're. Uh, I, see, I see that you have this very traditional inability to cope with foreign languages, which probably <laughs> entered the Australian gene pool from England. <laughs> oh, I've, uh, I, I, I'm honestly better than that, but it's just that this name was relatively new to me. Indeed. And, yes. uh, and, and so I haven't, um, you know, uh, mastered it. But as you say, I have a great difficulty with uh, me, certain, me too, uh, don't worry. <laughs> the phonetics of uh, certain foreign names. But uh, the satanic thing also we have in America, uh, 
aside from you know your, your little uh, gay clubs for uh, preschoolers, etc., they've now got Satan clubs yes. after school. <laughs> I mean, how did this get through the oven window? When did it say? If this had been mentioned when I was a young lad, you know the moral forces would have been so up in arms yeah. and uh, there probably would have been a crowd of vigilantes out, um, you know, t testing the strength of uh, Satan's power uh, through these people by lynching them, you know. Um, I, think, I, I think so. It's, it's staggering, isn't it? And for that matter, you think to the, the great dystopian novels of the last century, you know, Brave New World, Animal Farm and so on, at 1984, if the authors had put... Uh, this quite blatant satanic showboating or motivation because is, is it either people playing or is it something serious you know if you're a proper christian you believe it's something serious uh if you're not then it's still people playing at this but if one of those authors paul huxley or whoever had put this into one of those stories it would have been so ludicrous so unthinkable that it would have meant that, well, the publisher would say, you're not publishing that. This is utter nonsense. No one's going to believe that. It makes your whole story utterly incredible. And yet here we are, as you say, it's all around you. And whether they're doing it just for fun or whether they're doing it because they're really serious, it doesn't matter. Because, it's again, it's one of those things. It opens the doors. You open the gates of hell, whether you believe it or not, and all sorts of very unpleasant things will pour through. And uh, they've certainly opened uh, opened the gates of hell. I tell you, I mean, the tropes and the uh, subplots of modern entertainment are so uh, rife throughout mm. any uh, sort of program you want to watch that I've given up and I've just started downloading movies from the pre, uh, uh, you, you know, Hollywood classification era and from the... Uh, 40s etc yes. and exclusively i must say i've got a certain uh prejudiced intent here because i'm pretty much guaranteed not to have to look at uh you, 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 you know uh these uh minority groups that are so distressed um and uh, i find that very relieving but at the same time it does tend to tap you on the shoulder and say hey the only reason you're watching this is because <laughs> out there yes it's 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 so bad um now i want to uh, leap along to another uh, big event and loosely connecting it to the amorphous world of white nationalism kanye west nick yep. fuentes milo yiannopoulos um, made two appearances on uh, alternative media in the past week. One of them was on the sh uh, show of an American uh, centrist called Tim Pool. Yeah. Uh, and the other was on the Alex Jones program. And uh, it sort of created a vibe, and I've noticed this on Twitter with um, certain white, you know, resilient white nationalist identities that they're all praising this this nutter Kanye, <laughs> et cetera, um, because basically he's out naming the Jew. Mm -hmm. This seems to be their uh, a, a, a basis for it. Forget the fact that Kanye West is incapable of expressing a lucid, coherent thought and that what comes out of his mouth is, is just gibberish. Um, this Nick Fuentes, to my mind, and I have watched his progress, is a grifter. Um, mm -hmm. He's made his bones on the back of these uh, people from his America First uh, uh, group, and he's openly admitted to class chauvinism, i.e. if you don't have money, he doesn't think much of you. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, um, a spokesman for the right, uh, <laughs> spends his evenings... Uh, <laughs> Buried uh, up to his... Uh, uh, ah, no, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessary. Well, spends, a, a, does he still spend them or has he... Because for a while he went through this, uh, I'm no longer gay and I'm now a Christian and it, that was all horribly wrong. Has he, re has he reverted to type, do you know, or not? Well, about as much as a leopard changes its <laughs> spots. <laughs> I, I, you know... It, what he says, oh, I'm sorry, his uh, instincts can't be muted mm. uh, just for the benefit of his uh, 
the desired audience. Now, Conway West is, Kanye West is a black man um, uh, expounding, and I think largely on behalf of Nick Fuentes and Yiannopoulos, uh, the virtues of Hitler, <laughs> right? <laughs> that in itself is, is a paradox because I don't recall Hitler having terribly much time for uh, the black gentleman. <laughs> um, and especially those with white wives, which I think he had at one stage. Yes, yes, yes. He's uh, well, well, I mean, <laughs> And what's worse is he came on those programs wearing that Belinsky. Uh, um, there we go. I just got it out. I'm sure I didn't correctly well pronounce well it. Well done. So, yes. you know. I'm not the total uh, Barry Crocker uh, Orca, um, the stereotype. Uh, he, so this the ability to hoodwink these these white nationalists, right, um, is incredible. And the question has to be asked, since it all happened after they'd uh, gone along to Mar-a-Lago mm -hmm. uh, for dinner with Trump at a time, it seems to have... Uh, done very well for the DeSantis uh, side of the Republicans. Now, DeSantis has got himself quite a reputation as a doer. I mean, he dealt with the woke uh, Disney. He uh, had he rejected COVID restrictions in uh, in his state yeah. uh, in Florida. Um, but we know nothing about his foreign policy. We know. Oh, something we do. We do. We do. We know he's a stinking, appalling pro-Zionist, uh, and, right. and and he's a thoroughgoing neocon. So he's hysterical in his hatred of Russia. So he's he, he's uh, he's an ambitious politician on the make. So he will say what he has to say and do what he has to do. So socially, he's better than most of the rest from an American terms. Whether it's pro-life, anti-immigration, uh, anti the COVID lockdown, etc. Yeah, he's not as bad as the others. But you can't expect anyone in the uh, Republican milieu to do to be any better than Trump, who made the right noises about isolationism uh, and then uh, went in office. Well, you know, he uh, fired all those missiles at one point at Syria. But of course, he did tell the, Syri the Russians he was going to and they told the Syrians they were going to and they hit empty space. So and he's the only um, president in america for what basically your and my lifetime who hasn't started a war so trump was actually quite good in that regard for all he let so many people down and he failed but in the end he's one man surrounded by a, a gang a huge pack of hyenas what could he do but the idea that you're going to get someone better than trump in foreign policy terms is an utter nonsense it ain't going to happen it's simply impossible in the american system that was as good as it gets uh, so whoever you get next is going to be worse. So the best you can hope against in your, if you're an American uh, is that on other things, he's better than the Democrats, which I think probably DeSantis is. So it's not saying much, but they could be worse than DeSantis. Uh, and for that matter, because he's playing, yes, he's playing the uh, the Hispanic card. So all the hardcore racists are saying, well, yeah, that's wrong. Yeah, you've got to kick him all out. It ain't going to happen. You know, it's not going to happen. Lots of Hispanics are actually working quite hard in the American economy and they are paying taxes. So, yes, you've got the crime gangs and all the rest of it. Uh, but, you know, they're not as bad. Well, they're probably more more efficient than the than the black crime gangs. Uh, they're less efficient than the uh, the Jewish crime gang, which is basically taking over control of the country. Uh, but plenty of his ordinary Hispanics are assimilable to to the to American society as a whole. And what's more, there's so many of them that unless the Republicans get their votes, then as the white American boomer population dies off, then they are never going to be anywhere near power again. So if DeSantis is going for that middle class, up and coming, increasingly conservative Hispanic vote who look at uh, the cities where the Democrats have basically largely defunded the police and let black crime and black anti-white and anti-Hispanic racism run amok. If those people are now turning towards the Republicans, then from a Republican, I'm not talking from our point of view, from a nationalist point of view, but from a Republican point of view, which is to Santis and Trump for that matter, then actually trying to get those middle class people like middle class blacks on board 
is a sensible thing to do. And the hardcore white racists who are now so enthusiastic about uh, Kanye and uh, Fuentes and so on, <laughs> they can't complain because uh, look at yourselves. So coming on to the, the, the Fuentes thing, uh, for a little while I was thinking, well, I guess he's a grifter, but you know, what he's saying and doing compared to what was going before, compared to the lunatics involved in Charlottesville and so on, what he was doing was, you know, quite intelligent and he appeared to be building this movement which was based around American imagery and American ideas and American ideals, which is where American nationalism would need to go. But then the minute, and you pointed this out just now, the minute he's managed to get in to a dinner with Trump, then all the reasonableness out of the window and everything's about Hitler. So I think from that, that yes, he's a grifter. I didn't know about the class thing, but I'm not surprised. Uh, and on top of that, you just look, forget what they say, look at what they do. And having got there with Trump, this is even worse than uh, who was the clown with the, uh, the Sikh hiling, uh, the rounder time of Trump's winning. What was his name? Richard Spencer. Spencer, yes. So this is a thousand times worse than Spencer, because Spencer was doing that saying, I support Trump, in a meeting which Trump didn't even know about, and Trump had nothing to do with. And now Fuentes gets in and has dinner with Trump. And then the minute he's done that, comes out with his crazy nonsense. Uh, and so what those two have managed to do is to create the impression that the whole of American politics supporting Trump and rightwards are only interested in Hitler and the Jews. And this at a time when, with America, after all, has got the, the same fallout that we're getting, or it's, you know, it's coming their way, it's coming our way, from the actual effects of the COVID vaccines. America hasn't got the same problem that Europe's got with the real effects of the Ukraine war, but it's going to be pretty bad, as we were saying earlier on. They've lost their global power, military clout, over the Ukraine war. They can't. Another reason they can't send in their really new tanks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to the Ukraine war is to expose the fact that in, for modern warfare, now that drones are taken over, they are bloody useless. They can't. They can't give the Ukrainians their their F-35s because they are bloody useless. So the whole of uh, the uh, the superstructure of the American elite power is shaky and doing immense harm to ordinary Americans. And just at that moment, just at the moment where America can't actually go to war against China because China's got the industry, just at that moment when nationalists could say, well, we have been telling you this you know, for 50 years and you have gone ahead and offshored everything. So this is your fault. This is your globalism. Now, if you want to confront China, you've got no choice but to be nationalist. At the very point when the nationalists have basically won all the arguments, along comes this clown or grifter and throws the argument away and just says, if you're right wing, you support Adolf Hitler. So, yeah, to, to me, whatever my question marks, I didn't know much about the bloke. Unlike you, I haven't watched his videos to any extent and all the rest of it. I regard my uh, my time as being more valuable than that. Um, you know, I'm. 64 in a few weeks in a couple of months time so i can't afford to spend my time watching these cranks but therefore i didn't know much about him but now i see what he's done so i would now say he is working for them end of and he's making lots of money for himself while he's doing so grifter it seems to be the uh the the pattern in in these movements mm -hmm. i mean we see it in australia it's like uh the common sense practical nationalism espoused by the Australia First Party, particularly by the uh, ever-articulate Dr Jim Salem, mm -hmm. is constantly under assault. And it's, forget the left, it's always coming from the far right. Yeah. And particularly at this moment where we've got uh, a situation where we're considered fuddy-duddy by the uh, young blokes following a, a character, I'm not even going to mention his name, uh, who is is all of this, yeah. and he, um, he's facing some serious charges. But it just came to light um, through some interaction on Telegram that he's been accused of having uh, 
uh, traded uh, names of prisoners for uh, f for, for uh, exercise yard fa favours. And this guy's been in a camp with people that we know are rats that have completely uh, yeah. connected to the, the, the Liberal Party and state operators. And it, and this the, the, the individual that I'm talking about, the guy at the centre of it, the chief Nazi, is influential all through those uh, sub-tier American um, neo-organisations, yeah. the sort of residue Iron March type. And it got me to thinking, I believe this is an intelligence operation on a huge scale. I think it's not just ASIO uh, somehow running this guy, whether he knows it or not, or whether he does know it, whether he's realised that he doesn't yeah. really want to spend time in jail because he did get bail, where bail was fiercely uh, objected to by the prosecution hitherto, and it happened after this uh, alleged, uh, alleged uh, indiscretion of his. I believe that this Five Eyes runs this as one of its uh, social um, programs. Yeah, I've no I doubt believe. that they do. But I would say the only thing, I agree with you 100%, Nathan. Uh, we're running quite towards my available time, by the way, so we must sure. wrap up fairly soon. Uh, but it's not just Five Eyes. This isn't just an Anglo thing. It's in exactly the same thing. It's in Germany. It's in Italy. It's right the way across Europe the EU as well. So this is a Western NATO operation blanket. Uh, and that they learned, didn't they? You know, for, and I, th I think part of what they learned was when they were dealing with the BMP to, to break us, because we really scared them, electorally. Yeah. They had literally nightmares for 10, for 10 years solid, every single election, how we were going to do and our threat and so on was the main sub story of the election. And the MP did MPD did the same thing in Germany. Jean-Marie Le Pen did the same in France. Uh, the same has been done all over and in countries like uh, Slovakia and so on, Greece, the Golden Dawn and so on. So breaking that uh, potential electoralist insurgency, and there still was time for an electoral insurgency 10, 15, 20 years ago. There's not time now, not a really serious one. We could come to power. But we can't undo, undo what's been done. It would just be a different way to chaos and we get the blame. So but there was a, a moment and we terror collectively. The nationalists, certainly of Europe, terrified them. And Trump, to be fair, for all he's just a loose cannon. He's not one of us. He's a loose cannon they didn't control. And he terrified them as well. So now they've got to take action. And this is what it is. So no one. It's about full spectrum dominance. You can't even have a small nationalist party with some space around it in which to grow because the times are so unstable that everything could suddenly spin out of control because the electorate they're actually volatile very volatile because they're very angry and they know the people in power know that the electorates are set to get one hell of a sight more angry as they go we haven't talked about i haven't got time to talk about the uh, now the fact that germany is following holland in applying the eu rules for not just the decarbonization of the economy but the denitrogenization of the economy. So the EU has set that by, by 2030, the use of nitrogen fertilizer has to be cut by between 75 and 95%. So the whole of the European Union is about to go down the same road as Sri Lanka of doing away with modern industrial agriculture and having mass starvation as a result. So when you're setting about doing those things, you know damn well that you've got to break every single possible serious opposition. And the opposition to liberal globalism is nationalism. You know, that's it. So it's got to be broken. So there's there's that going on. That's what it is about, I think. And then there's a sub benefit that by crashing on about Hitler and so on, the minute someone is really bought into that and is totally alienated from our society and from normality and is fixated on the Second World War, the minute you've got a youngster like that, they are prime a prime candidate to be recruited into some kind of capitalist militia, private military force and turned into cannon fodder for the long war against Russia and China. So I think that's their secondary benefit. You ensure that nationalism is utterly disgraced from the public and the stupid young kids who do get involved are turned into 
feed for the military meat grinder. And of course, there's profits in that as well. So, yeah, I've, I agree with you entirely about what's going on here. And it's staggering how some people still watch this thing and say, oh, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great? Good old, you know, Fuentes. No, no grifter. And, and of course, Hitler is always the test, isn't it? I mean, a, a, yep. a analytical reading of the Second World War does not have Hitler coming out as the... Uh, the victor. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> either the victor or, or, the, uh, or the Pope of uh, no. white, whiteness, you know what I mean? No. He wasn't. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's all erroneous. But he is, and I think a lot of that misunderstanding around him came via the Americanization of the Nazi movement through yeah. uh, chappies like uh, uh, George Lincoln Rockwell yeah. Yeah. And, and William Pierce, etc. Yeah. But uh, I, it, it's false. It's just wrong. And you can't tell these kiddies because, of course, the minute you, uh, you, you, you offer up a negative or, or a contrary view to that, uh, you, you're a Jew. You're this. Yeah. You're yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It's it's yeah. it's a, a it is a self uh, self operating catch twenty two uh, yeah. protective uh, valve. You know it's it's uh, it's terrible. Well, before I bid you farewell, so you can make your time, I'll just say we got a question on our uh, comments on the YouTube channel. Is Nick Griffin? Uh, it said he's connected to the Knights Templar in um, in England. Is that part of that, uh, you know, uh, the Knights Templar order as in, um, you, you know, whatever uh, um, conspiratorial? Yes. No. Uh, well, the, the first thing is, yeah, I'm part of the Knights Templar Order International, uh, which is one of about 1,700 actually different modern incarnations of the original Templars. Nobody has a 100% direct link back. 700 years obviously we are not freemasons right most of the most of the the other serious size temporary organizations are the main one in in britain and the anglo world is intimately linked with freemasonry we are not freemasons we're a hardcore muscular christian organization not ecumenical we have members who are hardline protestants who are catholics who are russian and greek orthodox uh, and we don't want to create some soft, mishy, mushy uh, overall Christianity. You know, everyone must stick to their own confession, to their own version of the faith and not try and mix them. That's a heresy. So we're hardcore Christians, but we are highly practical in terms of what we do. So uh, we've uh, raised money and poured money into various proper Christian nationalist organizations around the world. Perhaps you put a link up to these two books for people who are yes, new. The first one we produced was Deus Vult, Ray Conquista of the West, Handbook for Resisting the Great Replacement. Yep. And uh, obviously it's about the Great Replacement and about the things I've been talking about and what we do so that our people, so that if you're a youngster watching this, the things that you can do so that your grandchildren or great-grandchildren, by you and your children being part of the remnant of our people and our faith and our DNA and our culture that get through the dark times so that your meek descendants will inherit the earth. So it's about that. Good practical stuff about the Great Replacement. The second one, The Great Reset Resistance, is about the Great Reset. But there's loads of books out there about the Great Reset and they all tell you how powerful Klaus Schwab is, how wicked it is. You're buying the book because you already know that. It's not much point. This book is only the first two chapters are about the first chapters about the Great Reset in COVID terms. The second chapter is about how this is actually very closely connected with the Great Reset in climate terms. And all the rest is about different historical and current forms of resistance to that, to this tyranny. And again, what people in practical terms should do about it. So we're an organisation which uses, especially amongst you mentioned, you know, young people look at fuddy daddies and so on. But the Templars for just um, purely popular cult, pop culture reasons have an enormous uh, sort of uh, credibility or interest factor amongst people of all generations, including youngsters. So by taking that extraordinarily valuable, powerful name and brand and turning it to good, rather than allowing it to be used by uh, people like uh, the 
uh, what was the name of the, Nor- the, the the massacre Nazi up in Scandinavia? Brevik, Anders Brevik, oh, yeah, yeah, said yeah, he was a Knights Templar and so on. So whether it's Masons or Nazi cranks, we didn't want to leave that thing there for bad people to use that name. We have that name and we're genuine. We just finished building the first uh, chapter house and genuine hardcore bricks and mortar chapel that's been built by a Knights Templar organization for 700 years. So we're a serious bricks and bricks and mortar, mortar organization with serious ideas. And if you put those links up to the two books, I'd be very grateful to you. And as I say, sure, yeah. series again, this is not Freemasonic in any way, shape or form. Rest assured. No worries. You were going to send me one of those books. Though. I haven't yet because you haven't sent me your address. I, I did. I'll send it again. You send, send it again. Sorry, I didn't see it. Him with the emails. It's like they get lost. I, I... Yes, I've lost it. You send it. I've lost it. Send it again, Nathan. I shall send you a copy of, the, of both of them. Uh, no worries. Well, mate, it has been enjoyable. It has been edifying and it's been very frightening talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> frightening because we don't have a hell of a lot of... Uh, um, you know, p- optimistic stuff to say. Um, yet, without some sort of optimism, you would just cave into sheer uh, uh, f- the f- the yes. futility of it yes, all. Yes, indeed. Yeah, oh, I don't think it's futile. I think this this we live in extraordinary times, Nathan. I and mean, to to be young in this time, which is literally the end, the collapse of a system which has dominated history for the last and our everyone's lives for the last 250 300 years to be there at the collapse of that and to be able to be one involved in the remnants this tiny group who will carry our culture our faith our dna through to the future what a time to live absolutely fantastic i must leave you now i hope that uh jim salim is better that man is a diamond you look after him no worries mate i'll see you later Cheers. speak to you soon